You are listening to the Next Play Podcast, the playbook for high-performing leaders who want to exceed their full potential. From walking on the Ole Miss football team at 5'7", 150 pounds, and earning a full D1 scholarship, to coaching thousands around the world and working with massive organizations like IBM, I've learned countless lessons that I'll be sharing right here with you. Join me as I interview some of the most successful people so you too can learn how to focus on always moving forward by deciding, planning, and executing on the next play relentlessly. This is Richie Contartesi with the Next Play Podcast. And today I have a very, very special guest for you. His name is Jeff Wright, and he is the man. He's done some really, really powerful things in the world of leadership, building businesses, developing people. So I'm super excited to introduce him. He is a serial entrepreneur who has had tremendous success in the business world, which you're going to learn about today. He is currently the CEO and president of Agent Sales Group. He's an annual speaker at the Top Gun Leadership Conference and a passionate leader and mentor to many. Jeff finds the most joy in helping others. So here's the big thing, because we talk about this all the time, helping others break past average to achieve life-changing financial freedom. So I'm super excited to bring Jeff to the podcast. So Jeff, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Richie. Absolutely. So your story is really powerful and I'm excited to learn to just to start with how you got into business, how you built agent sales group. And well, let's just start. How did you get in? How did you get into business? Okay. Well, the insurance business, you know, when, when you're six years old, no six year old boy says, God, I want to be an insurance guy. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. They want to be a cop. They want to be a firefighter. They want to, you know, be a professional wrestler, you know, nature boy, Ric Flair. They want to be, be something like that. Um, so my father, my father was always self-employed. Um, he, uh, my father owned a, a store outside of Atlanta and within that store, it was a lot of, he had a lot of businesses within that. He owned pawn shops, he owned poo halls. Uh, he was a, a bail bondsman. So you can imagine the kind of people I grew up around. Oh, you know, sure. you were bail bondsmen you, are hustlers, man. I, I work with a, yeah. I've been working with a company well, for four years. Well, you know, when bond. like you you played football at Ole Miss, I didn't play high school football. I didn't have time because when I got out of school, uh, I you know I didn't go to practice with my friends. I went to the jail to sign bonds and give criminals rides home. <laughs> <laughs> So that that took place of you playing, yeah, and and you know it, it, you're it was, right in bail. <laughs> it was a great it was a great education of what not to do, mm. of what not to do, not what to do, but what not to do. Like and actual, so, you mean like the industry of of just life in general, mm. just 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 life in general, because you know you you know I got to see firsthand what the consequences were of mm. of people breaking the law i got to see got it how how it you know that, that 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 destroyed every aspect of their life you know health financial relationships everything mm. so i learned you know very early on that that was not a place where i wanted to be got and it. so when i graduated from college um you know, I was in that environment. I, I didn't want to go back. I could, my dad desperately wanted me to come and take over the business. I'd been in that all my life. It was, uh, um, you know, kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, it was, you know, I didn't want to make money in the gutter anymore. I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to live, live that and, and have that mindset of these people because you are the sum of the people that you're around. Yeah. That is something that, and I, I I couldn't get, and that's actually big motivation from even for me now, you know, 30 years later is that, you know, I, I don't want to go back where I came from. Mm. You know, yeah. I just, I don't want to do it. And so when I was in college, I had started an equipment leasing company. We were, uh, me and a guy had got into partnership and we started leasing fax machines. Now this was back when a fax machine cost $8,000. Oh, wow. So we were we were leasing these fax machines to to attorneys and 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 to physicians and whatnot, and um, 
and that kind of led into to we started leasing other equipment. We were doing, um, you know, agricultural equipment, construction equipment, oil drilling equipment. Then we got into medical and we did really well, made a lot of money in 1999. We sold it. So wait, and, you start, just so I understand, you started this leasing business. This was your business. Yes. Got it. Where did you get all the equipment to be able to even lease it? Um, you know, it's really no different than financing cars or something. You know, the you had someone that was talking to a dealer who wanted to buy a bulldozer. You know, we would make it known to the dealer that we offered financing. The dealer would would call us and we would facilitate it like that. We were operating and oper, operating almost like a bank. Got it. Okay, so you were you were providing the the funding. We were providing the funding. And so what happened was, was we were selling the paper to, you know, banks in Germany, Canada, a few uh, in the U S so you'd get it and then sell it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Have to, because you, know, you, you have to discount the paper because, you know, unless you're general electric, nobody can afford to, to hold on to the kind of numbers that we were doing. So the banks were starting to require us to put life insurance on the lessees. And mm -hmm. we had started referring that life insurance business out to, to someone. We had no idea how much money was in it. And until we went to his Christmas party and this guy, guy actually lived in Vegas and we're like, wow, this guy's living large. So we, we started doing a little, little investigation about the, uh, how much money was in it. And we're like, Nah, we're never because we're never referring any business to this guy again, because we personally made this guy probably 30 million dollars in commissions. Damn. Yeah. Over over a period of, of four or five years. And like, no, we're getting in the business. So we had gotten in the business. We were doing well with it. And then uh, then we sold the company. Uh, my partner wanted to go another way. And I still like the financial services business. So I stayed with the, uh, with, with the insurance route. So that's how I got in it. And it was, it, it was also kind of at a time in, you know, 99, 2000, there were a lot of brokers that were having a hard time, um, you know, getting equipment deals and whatnot. We had really good relationships with these guys. So we just put them to work selling insurance. So that was another way how we, we ended up building an organization as large as we did. Got it. Is that the company you have today? Yes. Got it. So, so you've had one company since with the company you sold in college? Yes. Dang, that's so rare. You don't see Yeah, that. I'm never, uh, you know, I, I, figured that, I figured that I needed to, to, to be on my own because some of the uh, guys in my fraternity had a, uh, had graduated, had gotten jobs, and I listened to all the bullshit that they had to put up with, and uh, I knew that I would be the worst employee on earth. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't even, I, to me, it wasn't even an option. But how did you keep, like, most people don't keep a business for very long. Like, how were you able to, like, this is one company. How many, how, how many years has it been open for? Well, let's see, 19, we started, we started doing the, uh, the equipment leasing in 86, in 1986. How did you do that, by the way? How did you just like come up with that model and then start a business while you're in college? Uh, because this guy uh, who was a doctor uh, wanted to get a fax machine. And he, he went to my dad for the money. And my dad was just talking about how much this machine cost and telling me about all the things I'd never even heard of a fax machine before. Yeah. And, and he's talking about how much it cost. And, and, and so instead of selling it to the doctor, he, who was in an office building, he rented it to the whole building and started charging memberships into it. And, 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 you know, this $8,000 machine started generating him $8,000 a month in revenue because I mean, you know, back then 
when when they put when they put that fax machine in that building yeah uh, it was there were less than 10 fax machines as i understand there were less than 10 fax machines in the whole city of atlanta wow yeah that's crazy yeah now fax machines don't even work so what's yeah. the point yeah they're you know they're <laughs> they're what 50 bucks now yeah 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 if yeah, it, so, it and, and that's if it works that's if it works but but um you know i i got in that business i liked it uh you know i liked it a lot but towards the end it was getting very 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 stressful for me oh really uh, so oh yeah so stressful in fact it, it actually put me in the hospital once damn how did you deal with that what it, like what what happened when you were stressed well My hospital he, you have panic to, attack or uh, I had what was called a trans ischemic attack. Got What's lost. That? In, got, I never heard. It's like a mini stroke. I got lost in my own house. Whoa. And, How old? And you were in what, 22? No, no, no. This was in 99. So I would have been what, 34. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. And so um, it, it, it was, it, it was funny. I was eating. I was with my then wife. We were sitting in a Mexican restaurant eating chips and salsa. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't remember how to pick it up, how to pick up a chip. But the thing is, is that that, that business oh. is very stressful. If you, you know, you, you have a guy who, who needs a, a bulldozer to do a job. Yeah. You have a say, you know, but he's got, you know, crappy credit. He has, a, you know, ha, you know, he's not paying child support. He's not doing all this stuff. Okay. So, so, you know, if, if they were coming to us, they pretty much had exhausted everything else. So mm. you, you have, you have this guy who desperately needs it. Then you have this salesman who's living hand to mouth, you know, from deal to deal, he needs the commission. He, so, and then you have the owner of the company who needs to make the sale. So you have just on one deal, you have three people calling you every five minutes. Right. Mm. And then multiply that by a couple of hundred deals that you may have going at the same time. Wow. Yeah. So when did and, you make the transition? So how, so you made the transition from that business to agent sales group. Yeah. I made that, made the transition in 99 when I sold the company. What did, did you take you? So you, you must've been like, okay, I learned my lesson about this, this, and this, my next company, I'm going to build it a certain way. What, what was that? Well, you know, compared to the stresses that were in that business, you know, the insurance business was nothing. You know, it mm -hmm. was like running a lemonade stand. It, it was just, <laughs> it was just easy. And, and what was easy about it was that we very quickly developed systems to where we had all these guys that, that needed to work. And we found lead systems and whatnot to where we could train a guy and and hand him leads and literally have him making money the next week how did you create that system that's um, the thing that's that's everyone wants to know like their acquisition system like that's a crazy acquisition system here's leads make money in one week that's well one of the guys uh one of the guys uh that uh, i became friends with who um sold insurance for one of the carriers that we that we did back when we were in the leasing business had got it and gotten into this thing called mortgage protection mm -hmm. and uh and it's something that we still do today we do do a lot of it and when and he was telling me about um when somebody buys a house or refinances a house that data becomes public record we send them a letter and, uh, and, and ask them about, uh, and, and talk to them about the benefits of paying their house off. Uh, if, if they die, if, if, you know, if they got a 30 year mortgage and if they, if the person dies in 10 years, his wife and kids have a big problem. And, uh, people were extremely, extremely receptive to it. It, the, the product also had a caveat to it in that, if they kept it for 30 years, the, if they kept the, the, the insurance policy for 30 years, then at the end of the term, all the money that they paid into the policy would be refunded back to them. They wouldn't earn any interest off of it, but, right. but essentially they would get it for, for no cost. So 
that was a big seller selling point for us. So, you know, uh, of course, these days are long gone too. But back then, we were doing mailings and we were getting back 15, 20% responses. Back That's, uh, now, now we're doing backflips if we get one and a half. Yeah, direct, direct. But it's, let me ask you a question though. Direct, direct mail is I feel like most people aren't doing that anymore because everyone was, is in the inbox, is in the email inbox. So do you feel like getting that old school kind of, well, insurance, I guess, maybe not. I don't know. Is it, is um, it coming back at all? Or do you still do direct mail? We still do direct mail. You know, my, uh, my postage bill runs, you know, forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a week. Mm. But even at that, we're still making money. Right now, we, you know, do, do we also generate things online? You know, we, we generate leads online. Uh, we have just uh, we've gone in partnership actually with with a hospital in Miami and with a, a big personal injury firm. This thing was so expensive. But the three of us, we actually partnered and uh, we bought an artificial intelligence system that is terrifying what this thing will do. Um, we're in the process of setting, setting it up now. Um, hopefully we're, we'll be able to launch it in a couple of weeks, but the lead generation that we'll get from that, I think will be really good. Is it like, like email or like, is it, uh, what type of AI? It sounds interesting. Email voice and text. Hmm. That's crazy. So like if someone calls in or something like that, it'll be able to walk them through like to book a meeting or something. It'll like have that? a conversation with you in text. No, no, no. In voice. It can have either way. I'm scared. It's terrifying. So, <laughs> so if we, so if we want to book an appointment, it's going to say, uh, all right, so next week, you know, the, the 25th, we can meet at 9, 2.30 or 4.30. How did it come up with those numbers? Because it's looking in the calendar of your phone. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it's crazy. And it'll do this in voice, text, or email? Yeah, we hit it hit it with all three. It, it's, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool system. Are you going to try and, and grow it and sell it like as a software? A software as a service or no? No, no, we, we bought the software, so it's not ours to sell, but we, we are using it. Um, we we want to do it for lead generation, maybe sell the leads down the road. But once we, once we figure out how to do it for insurance, then doing it for a, a car dealership or, you know, my wife is a doctor. She owns a medical spa, uh, you know, generating leads for, uh, you know, for Botox or boob jobs or God knows what, um, you know, it, it's, it's all, it's all about moving that traffic because, you know, it, you know, not one thing is everything. A lot of people think that that social media is the answer and it's not, you know, that that's just a part. Oh, of you mean it. social, like social media marketing? Yeah. Social media marketing is, that's yeah. just part of it. You, you, it's you have disruptive to have a multi marketing. It really is. You, you it have is to, yeah. yeah. It works, but B, like for B2B, for example, disruptive marketing is much, it's, it's much more challenging than it is for B2C. Mm -hmm. It also depends. Is it something that they need certain times of the year or is it something, cause that's more, you, you're going to want to use something more of like Google ads for something like that. Whereas, so, so interesting. So, so you, but nothing, nothing beats seeing people though. Oh nothing, my God. Nothing, Speaking. Nothing beats that. Do you teach your agents to go and speak at like, event? cause like if you go speak at an event, your conversion rate is going to be we, so we, high. We do. Uh, not many of them do it because the they, they've limited themselves that they can't do it. They're embarrassed. They think they're going to get judged, but you know, it's funny. I was, I was telling not about some, being judged. It's about getting clients. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, the fear, the fear of failure has killed more dreams than actual failure ever has. Yeah. 
So how do and, you teach your team to overcome failure? How big is your team, by the way? Just curious. How many agents we have? Yeah, how many around, agents? Around 22,000. You have 22,000 agents? Yes. How many of those are active? All of them. Wow. All of them. Now, I would not have... Good for you, man. That is 22,000... So give me, give me some perspective, like, a, a what's a, well, what's a, a, a big company in, in the insurance space? What's a, a Geico's ridiculous, but uh, big, mutual of Omaha is a big one. Well, how many agents do they have? Uh, mutual would probably have a quarter of a million. Holy smokes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So keep going. Yeah. Sorry. I don't mean to, <laughs> I'm just curious. I just wanted some perspective. That's all I 22 thousand you said right yeah around somewhere around in there it fluctuates now uh there is a caveat to that though we do business with a lot of of big brokerage houses that have agents that that get contracted with us so that number includes that uh how many do we work with directly uh around four thousand that it. we work that we work with directly which is still a big number I mean, it's a lot. <laughs> I mean, they're basically so. I mean, you don't. Have, I don't know what you're like. You know, obviously, this is a podcast. But I was, is it something where it's you know, it's it's mainly commission based, right? It's, it's not it's all commission based. Got it. They're, so they, they're, there's no obligation for them to attend trainings and stuff like that. No, no. You know, the only the only obligation they have is is like we have a group that for lack of a better term, we call them captive groups. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that we pay for their leads. And, um, you know, and we just keep a bigger portion of their commissions because we're, we're paying for the leads. Right. Um, so we, we have them come to the trainings and whatnot. And, and if, if they don't, that's fine. We just don't give them activity anymore. Hmm. Got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. When you say activity, that's leads. It's leads. Yes. Yes. Do, do a lot of them do a lot of self-gen, like they get their own leads? Um, not as many as I would like. Mm. No. Got no. it. How did no. you do that? How did you, I mean, obviously it's been what, 20. So how did you, building a team of 1099s that stay active? That's really, I mean, how did you do well, that? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something else that'll blow your mind. Um, the Zoom calls. Now, now, now before 2020, I hardly ever did any Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. Now I do, you know, 30 of them a week. Okay. But, and I, I pretty much only do the, the, the Zoom calls with the captive, the captive agents. What's captive? Those are the ones getting. The, the ones that we're doing leads for. Okay. Um, the zoom, the, I would say, uh, on any given zoom call, mm -hmm. the rookie has been there five or six years. Mm -hmm. well, Think about that. Yeah. That's how small our turnover is. And the reason why our turnover is so low is, you know, we're, we're good to these guys. We, we treat them well. Yeah. They, how they, do you do that? Like, what do you do? Like when you say treat them well, like what are some things that you do? Cause I know I'm telling, we work with a lot of like, so there's a lot of sales leaders who manage 1099s who really struggle. Um, so what are some things that you do to treat them well, to keep, you know, to keep, to have that kind of retention? It, you know, it's the same with, it's, it's the same with, with success in anything. And that is to do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. If, if we, if we promise somebody that we're going to have something to them by a deadline, it's always to them before that deadline. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we keep our word yeah. to these people and, 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 Oddly enough, sadly enough, in our industry, that's a, actually quite a rare thing. Oh, really? Yeah, very much so. Mm. Very, very much so. You know, the difference, the difference between me and a lot of guys that would be at my level 
is these guys kind of came up as insurance agents and they never really ran businesses. And a lot of them really don't know shit about money and whatnot. Well, you know, I was in the money business. So I, I have a far greater knowledge of how things work Got in, it. in terms of running the business than these guys do. Mm. Um, and I'm friends with a lot of these guys. There's nothing, nothing against them, but, but, um, you know, a lot of them use like, uh, you know, call it a, uh, you know, a used car salesman mentality. Uh, that, that, that's not the right term, but at the moment I'll use it, but that that's kind of how it is. And so, uh, a lot of people will, you know, over promise under deliver to yeah. people. And, uh, the biggest thing that I want to do is everything that we provide to, to our salespeople. I want to give them everything as advertised. And that's very rare. Yeah. Um, and, and there, there are tons of companies that are just notorious about not delivering something as advertised, as advertised. I, I will delay if we're coming out with a new product with a company, I will delay announcing it forever until I know exactly what it's going to look like mm. because there's nothing worse than getting guys hopes up over something that is not going to exist. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Got it. And, and so these things that you're, that you're saying you're going to do and do, is there anything in particular that of those things that you're doing that really differentiate you than other leaders it's like we answer, we answer the phone mm. you know you know or you know we answer the phone we get back to these people in a timely manner if they have a problem we we get a lot of these problems solved for them or, or we provide them with a lot of guidance and then you know that's all our back office people that that do that do all that uh all the back office people have been there forever um, you know, and, and, I, and I pay like, like the, the people that actually work for me, the W2s that, that work for me, I pay them very, very, very well. Um, my assistant, when she had a child, um, I, I paid her for a year to sit at home, paid, oh, wow. her full, paid her full salary. She came back to work. She got pregnant to have another child. I just rented some space down the hall and turn it into a nursery and hire her a nanny. Mm. Plus, plus I was paying someone to go clean up her house twice a week. Now people say, wow, Good you're so you. cool. You're so cool to do that. Well, maybe so, but I wanted her at work. You know, she, you know, she's, you know, very special. It, it's, you know, I told somebody one time it's, it's, uh, you know, you can find a wife anywhere, but to get a, get an assistant that you, that you can trust, that's hard. <laughs> and that's, that'll stay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's impressive, man. So how do you manage 4,000 or 22,000 people? Like, how do you do that? Like, how do you structure that? <laughs> it's all done through, it's all done through managers that we have. So, you know, by and large, we don't, uh, we don't talk to most of the agents other than with zoom calls. We, we talk like with big, me, big me. zoom calls. I with... talk, I talk to managers and, and, and team leaders, you know, mm -hmm. unless they're on a zoom call, if they want to say something, that's fine. But I actually, you know, during, you know, when, when the lockdown started with mm -hmm. these guys, I had a lot of managers call me up saying, you know, Hey, um, uh, you, uh, you may as well get rid of this thing because it's not going to do any good. Nobody's going to buy anything. It's the end yeah. of the world. We're all going <laughs> to fucking die all that. And so, um, uh, I didn't need that kind of negativity in my life. So I just said goodbye to them. Oh, wow. How many did you have to do that to 31 managers? Yes. Whoa. 31 did it all in one at one time on a zoom call because they all had the same kind of attitude they, they all had all... the same attitude okay now uh, now you drill it down even further all the agents most of these people had never sold insurance online before so we I mean, we had to reinvent the way we were going to do this overnight 
So we had these guys sign up for online training. Mm -hmm. We gave them a week deadline to sign up. You know, Friday, five o'clock, five thirty. I call my assistant. How many did not sign up? Mm. She said, uh, probably about a third didn't. I said, terminate their contracts. They're gone. With this, wait, agents or the managers? Agents. Got it. Then they do the online training. Then we start to do the Zoom calls. I sent each group three links to three YouTube videos. One was like a Tony Robbins. The other one was Gordon Ramsay throwing a chicken or something. And the other was a, a Three Stooges, just three. Seven minutes of total video. I asked who didn't take the time or who didn't have time to look at the videos. People were starting to hold up their hands and we got rid of them on the Zoom call right there. Huh. When I did that, I had every, everybody else that was left, I had their absolute undivided attention. <laughs> That's for sure. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And so by cutting out a third of, of a workforce and basically getting rid of all this dead work, dead wood, because the one thing that I knew, because I've been doing this, you know, I've, you know, I've been doing this since, you know, Gulf War, 9-11, all that. One thing I can tell you is that when, you know, any, any crisis happens or anything like that, yeah. uh, the actual activity in our business goes through the roof. Mm. And I knew that it would in lockdown because yeah. especially now we're doing a lot of this marketing by mail. These people aren't working. They're not going anywhere. They got nothing better to do than open their damn mail. So our lead activity went up. And probably the cost because not probably a bunch of people pulled back from doing direct mail. So it probably lowered the cost a little, no? No, it actually increased it because we didn't anticipate all these people doing all these refis. We didn't anticipate Uh, all these people buying houses and whatnot. So so basically cutting at the end of the day in, in 2020, we cut our workforce by a third. And increased our business by 400%. And do you think a lot of that was attributed to cutting the fat and staying true to? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, you know, I, I was getting, I was getting calls from these guys saying, Hey, that was a real shitty thing you did to Bob. I said, well, Bob, Bob, you know, you know, he didn't do this. He, you know, you know, you know, he didn't show me any kind of commitment. And And before, before you start crying for Bob, you know, the extra 20 leads a week that Bob was going to be getting, you're going to be getting really. They're like, Oh, okay. Oh, well, fuck Bob. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And so, and then, and then when, when we started doing the zoom calls, I told, you know, guys asked me, what are we going to do? And I I said this on every Zoom call. I said, boys, because most of them are guys. I said, boys, this was not the hand that we wanted dealt to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we got to play it like it's the one we've been waiting our whole fucking life for. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a choice. Everybody's like, we don't have a choice. Yeah. And so the other, the other thing that I did though, is with, with the zoom calls, I had a rule of, and still do of zero negativity, none. Now, if they want to call one of us privately and bitch cry and moan, that's fine. But if I've got a call of 50 people, all it takes is one. Yeah. One jackass. All all it takes one jackass. Yeah. You know, there's a saying, if, uh, if a clown enters a castle, he'll never be King, but the castle will become a circus. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful to keep that toxicity out. Oh yeah. And so, um, so we, we had some attrition there too. People would, would be on the zoom calls, go, Oh my God, I didn't have anyone, you know, I didn't sell anything this week. I didn't. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Well, so how many, how many man, like how many managers do you have today? 
Um, well, basically we, we reappointed a, a, a bunch of guys as managers as, you know, that were team leaders as managers, all the main managers, the 31, we just got rid of them all. Got it. So yeah. now, so now you have agents who are just team lead or who act as team leads, team leaders. Yeah. And, got it. and we incentivize these guys because, what we did was the 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 ones the ones that made it through the wash. Another thing that made them happy, well, the manager was gone, so that was that was money we weren't paying them. We passed that directly along to the agents, mm. so they all got an increase in commission. Mm. Got so it. so yeah, they they didn't really feel too sorry for for these so it, guys being gone either. Yeah. So, we're, so this, the sales, the managers before weren't acting as agents. They were just the leadership role. They were just the leadership role. Most of them, they, they all were agents at one time. Most of yeah. them though, just, and, 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 and there's more to it than that, Richie, you know, yeah, I'm sure you know, I I'm found, sure. I found that, that they, they were really doing nothing. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I, I can't blame them for that. I can only blame me for that. You know, I, for I sure. Slept. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I, do you, I have to own that. But do you feel like you have challenges now though, with trying to, to teach agents who are still active agents, how to lead and manage other agents are you finding that are you finding challenges in that area no because what we what we did is we i created an environment with them to where they're they're financially rewarded to help each other mm. so if we when we have a zoom call and i had gotten this idea from a guy that we had hired to speak at one of our conventions he was uh he was a uh a, a a Navy Blue Angels pilot. Oh, nice. Okay. And he talked about this. This is real important for people to hear. He, he yeah. talked about the most important part of a mission was the debriefing. Absolutely the most important part. And the reason why on their uniforms, the, the ranks are Velcroed on there mm -hmm. is because yeah. when they go into a debriefing, everybody tears their rank off. It all goes in a bowl. So a lieutenant is equal to an admiral who may be on that on that team. Mm. And it gives them the freedom to speak freely, to critique each other, to make each other better. Mm -hmm. It's all about the debriefing. So we treat this as a debriefing in that, you know, there's no judgment. No one is going to, you know, make fun of anyone. No one is going to, going to, you know, needle anybody for not doing anything. If somebody has a bad week, everybody's jumping in. What's going on? What's, you know, you know, and, and a lot of times it could be their wife. It, it could be their husband. It could be anything. And they'll even talk about that, how to, you know, you know, how to deal, deal with that. And, you know, have you thought about taking her to dinner? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So, it, it creates a very nurturing environment and a non-judgmental environment because if someone is, if someone feels less, uh, feel like that they're not going to be judged, they're going to be far more forthcoming and, and being more vulnerable into what their problems are because, you know, it, the name of the game, you know, the, especially when you're selling, the more vulnerable you make someone, the more you're going to be able to, to truly help them. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And if you can be vulnerable too, it allows others, it allows them on the other side to be more vulnerable, which yeah. is, so you, we mentioned something early on just in our, our, our little bit of time here left. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think you've <laughs> provided a lot. You mentioned the, the failure and the fear aspect of things, you know, and I think a lot of, salespeople and sales leaders especially struggle with salespeople that have that challenge um you know the next play is about eliminating fear and eliminating failures by from people's lives by keeping them focused on the play in front of them with that being said i mean i'd love to hear your you know i'd love to hear your philosophy around keeping your sales salespeople in the game and keeping them 
you know, constantly not because like we talk, I mean, speaking, for example, if you're a salesperson, you're speaking on a stage and you're able to articulate what you do and truly genuinely care about your audience and want to help them. It's the best form. And it so, is. you know, it's like, how do you get, and, and, and this is something I share with, with clients too, is like, how, how do you get people to do the things that are scary? Because those are the things that are going to get them the business. That's right? what's going to get them paid. It's, it's, it's the, it's the easy things that everybody else is doing. You do the things that everybody else isn't doing yeah. and you're going to get much better results, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, the first because we we talk about this a lot. The first thing I talk to them about is developing good habits. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know, when you get up in the morning, don't pick up the damn phone. <laughs> good luck with that one. All right. Yeah, don't pick up the phone. <laughs> now, yeah. now one of the things that I do, uh, and and I've done this for a long time, is is affirmations. Mm -hmm. Okay. I say them and out those loud. Those work for you. That you they, find they, that they absolutely work. They'll work for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but but so one of the one of the sales processes that I teach, yeah, my salespeople is to have people ask them questions in such a manner to where the person is out loud telling them uh, what. Uh, you know, what the benefits would have, what their concerns are, what the consequences would be if they don't do something. You want them to say that out loud. And the reason why you want them to do that is because you can hear them, but most of all, they're hearing themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I did when there was something that, that I didn't want to do you know, let, you know, let's say, let's say, for example, I don't want to go to the gym today. I go to the gym every day, but you know, let's say I don't want to go to the gym today. Good for you, by the way. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Go well, ahead. what I, what I would say to myself, I don't, and I would say this out loud. I don't want to go to the gym today. If I don't go, but if I don't go to the gym today, it's going to hurt my health. It's going to, it's going to, uh, uh, you know, it, it's going to cause me to live less. It's going to, I start telling myself out loud what the consequences are. And then I start telling myself what the benefits are going, going to be. I actually say that. So if someone doesn't want to call five leads a day, I, I will have them and I'll have them do it on the Zoom call. I said, you know, repeat this after me. If I don't sell, if I don't pick up the phone today, I'm going to lose sales because the leads are going to go bad. And if I don't get sales, I'm not going to make money. I'm not going to make my mortgage. I'm not going to be able to feed my children. But if I do, I'm going to be able to send my kids to a better school. I'm going to be able to do that. So I actually try to put them in the habit of actually verbalizing this. Yeah. Not, not for me to hear it, but for them to hear it. Got it. How do you get them to do that? I find like that would be so hard. Uh, I make I, I, I make them do it on the call. Mm. I make them do it on the call. Yeah. And and you know one of the things too, that one of the most terrifying things that I found out for a lot of people to do mm -hmm. is to pick up a, a video Facebook Live and start talking. Mm. It's terrifying for people. Mm. Yeah. If if you can break that fear of just someone that they don't have to be talking about sales. They don't have to be talking about what they do, anything. Yeah. To have someone break their fear of doing that. And, and the, and the reason why you want to do that, you want to get them past the fear of judgment of other people's opinions. Yeah. Right. At the end of the day, that's what you want to do. So I have these guys, I will, I'm, I'm not, I haven't done it lately, yeah. but I actually have had them, uh, do a Facebook live and then made them email us the link so we could go look at it. Had, had to be at least 30 seconds. Nice. Did, and, you, did you find that they started doing it after that? Like, Oh, they started that's not doing, hard. A lot of them started doing it more and more. Cause that a lot is, of them started doing more and, and that's a form of speaking. It's just another, it's, it's another exactly stage. right. 
And what what's happened with not with all of them, but a lot of them, their business has actually increased. People, if they start talking about what they do, people, go, oh, I didn't know you sold that. Yeah, I've been looking for insurance. I, I didn't know you, I didn't know you sold that. You do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's your next play? You built this company. Uh, you know, you made some big changes during COVID. You know, you kind of you you, you had some decisions about a, a route that you could go, right? We kind of talked about what what's your next play? What, well, the next play is my wife and I are in the middle of buying a couple of surgical centers in Tampa that are that are coming up it's not not in the bag yet you know real estate real estate in florida is a uh everywhere rough game rough yeah, game so overpriced oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean we got there, there was a house two two doors from me that went for a million and a half over ask in cash <laughs> crazy <laughs> why are people buying that i don't understand well i can understand why they're moving here i guess yeah, but why are they but, it's it, it's going to take them twenty years to recoup that. It will. It will. I, I I don't I don't understand it either. But you know one thing the one thing that I've learned just observing things in life. You know Hollywood actually uh, talks does this very well. If you're looking watching any movie where you have a cataclysm or you have anything, you got. 99% running this way and 1% running this way. These guys live, these guys get killed. Yeah. So if, if you follow the crowd, um, you know, I, I don't, and I think that's what a lot of this is, yeah. you know, to be honest with you, it's just, you know, people just following the crowd because it's just the thing to do. And to me, it's just insane. Yeah, we were, we were actually, I grew up in Florida and we were looking at moving back to Florida because that's where all my family is in Palm mm -hmm. Beach. <clears throat> and we're not doing it because we're just, we're going to stick with, because what we have is a good deal right now. And if we look down there, it's oh, yeah. absolutely anything decent in the area is like, at least, I mean, it's a lot. It's crazy. Yeah. So we're, yeah. we're going to hold out and just wait because eventually, so where you live, um, Gulf Coast, right? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, people eventually will get tired of the humidity and be like, oh, I'm getting out of here again. <laughs> you know, six years, you know, it's great. Six years ago, I bought a house for my mom to stay in, in, in the winter. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to Atlanta next week to pick her up, but it's a single level house. She's 82 years old. So it's everything's on the ground. No step. It's a block away from the water. I bought the house for $175,000. And I have realtors calling me all the time, offer me a million two for a, a two, and it's like 1100 square feet. It's, it's insane. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Crazy stuff, man. Well, cool. So you're going to get these surgical centers. That's your next. That's our next, that's our next big thing. <sighs> nice. Well, is, listen, man, is, is there the anything centers? that you want to share that I didn't ask you around just your, your leadership philosophy, or, I mean, I feel like we got a lot out of this, but is there anything that you wanted to share that I didn't ask about? You know, a lot of people will ask me, uh, I get asked all the time, what advice do you give someone who's starting a business or, or running a business, whatever. And that is be obsessed if you truly want to, if, if you truly want to be successful at the next level, uh, you don't have to be good at it. You have to be obsessive about it. If you look at any athlete, top level athlete, if you look at, you know, you know, artist, you know, guitar player, whatever, these people were absolutely obsessed with what they did is be obsessed with what you're doing and don't care about what other people think. Don't, don't, don't. The, the only opinions you, of, of people that you should value are the people that are either at or above the level where you want to be. Yeah. That's the truth because there's so much, there's so many people out there who, who never take off and do what they dream just because they're worried about what some dipshit at home is going to think about them. It, it's, it's sad. Yeah. 
I like to be obsessed. I mean, everybody, every, you're right. Every athlete, artist, singer, speaker, you know, the, the best in any field is, isn't definitely always the most talented, but they are absolutely the most obsessed. Yeah. So yeah. that's. My wife and I went not long ago, we saw Eric Clapton. He played in Tampa and she was just mesmerized with how good he is. I'm like, well, God, he's 77 years old. He's been playing for 70 years. And, you know, it, it, I could even tell he was breaking strings while he was playing, but, uh, you know, but that came from total obsession with, uh, with what he does. It's like Tom Brady obsession. It's just Nick Saban obsession, Belichick. Uh, and you look at a lot of artists. I mean, they're, they're obsessed. So listen, man, this was absolutely an amazing talk. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Yeah. So I I appreciate your time. I don't want to keep that, keep, keep too much more of your time, but I really appreciate it. And I, I hope to have you on again in the future. I think there's a lot of value as far as a leader. And I want to kind of, in our next talk, I want to dive into what you're doing with the top gun and, and what you're doing with all that. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm excited to to have you back in the future. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the next play podcast. If you liked the show, make sure to leave us a review for more resources, visit relentlessuniversity.com or download the free Relentless University app. And if you're interested in having me speak at your next event, visit relentlessrichie.com. Until next time.